Good morning to all of you in the West and good afternoon to all of you in the East. Uh, I am incredibly grateful to have all of you join us today uh, for this uh, week's webinar. And we have a, a very special guest this week with me, uh, a friend of mine, but way more importantly than that, uh, somebody who I believe has been a, uh, a Canadian institution and a purveyor of such sensible, inf of such sensible information uh, in financial planning for, for God more than, more than 30 years. Uh, David Chilton, as we all know, is a best-selling uh, author of The uh, Wealthy Barber, and then again, The Wealthy Barber uh, Returns. Uh, he's a very astute uh, investor, Tibby personality, uh, and he's been studying personal uh, finance, business, uh, business investment for, for more than 30 years. David, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, no problem. And happy to be here and happy to uh, talk to everybody out there. Yeah, well, we've got a jam-packed hour, I think. And uh, you and I were just speaking offline for the last 15 minutes and talking about how crazy of a world it actually is right now. And, you know, I would love to hear the Wealthy Barber's perspective on, on COVID-19 and, and, you know, and how you see the world today and how it's changing and maybe just a perspective to kind of start on, on what's going on. You know what I did to, uh, to get ready for this interview, and I'm not kidding, about an hour ago, I went and I jumped into Lake Huron. No wetsuit. <laughs> You're kidding me. With just my bathing suit on. I'm figuring it was the low 40s Fahrenheit, and that was a very stupid move. Okay, that was very, <laughs> so if I say anything that makes no sense whatsoever, I'm blaming on the brain shock I received from going on. Wow. You know, the, the whole COVID-19 thing has obviously been fascinating. From my perspective... I've been sitting back and taking literally 50 and 100 phone calls a day and texts from friends and people I don't even know, often small business people and going through their challenges and talking to a lot of friends too. And what jumps at me most is how differently we're all experiencing this challenge. So for example, I have a tremendous number of friends who are teachers and work in the public sector and do a marvelous job. And they're calling me for the most part to talk about Ozark. And then I've got a group of people who own restaurants and they're calling me quite literally in tears. Mm. And so everybody's experiencing it so differently. And obviously, you've had a, if you've had a family member directly affected by it, that makes it extremely difficult. So it's a challenging time in that front. On the business situation, certainly a lot of the government initiatives have been big difference makers. They really have been. I remember tweeting right away, they're going to have to get out in front of this with the small business people with wage support. They'll probably have to do more rent subsidies as well. Eventually, when we pull ourselves out of this or start to, we'll have to go to more infrastructure spending. So deficits are going to run wild. But in defense of the government, had they not done those things, we might have had even bigger deficits because we could have had a collapsing economy as opposed to a very challenged one. So those initiatives have really helped. That being said, there are a lot of small business people out there just in a world of pain right now. And it's almost the smaller the business, the worse it is in some respects. We're all talking about restaurants, of course, and they are really suffering. But you and I talked off there about people who own hotels. Right. And I find in Canada, a lot of Canadians are under the mistaken impression that these hotels are all owned by mega corporations, but they're not. They're mostly franchises where you just right. license the name and the management and everything else. And a lot of local people, one, two, three people come together and they have millions of dollars invested in these. And they're making huge monthly payments right now with no occupancy whatsoever. And it's a very tough situation for them. But you think about uh, everybody from the haircutters through to the physiotherapists, et cetera, tough stuff. They're making their mortgage payments. They're the lease payments. They're having to cover off certain other fixed costs. But here's the most interesting part, Gary, and what I think your audience will find most fascinating. Most of the people calling me have already figured out how they're going to get through or not get through the current situation. They're more concerned with what happens if we start back up and my top line only goes back to 70 and 75% of its former level. That people are a little bit low to spend, or I'm tied into tourism, or we still have social distancing, and all this drags out for a year or two, then they're in big trouble because their business has operational leverage. They have fixed costs that mean if their top line falls, say 20%, their bottom line could fall 75 to 80. Right. And a lot exactly. of people are saying, like to be perfectly honest, they're saying at that level, I don't have a lot of interest in running my business. Yeah. And so it's what happens after we get out of this that's got them a little bit more intimidated than even the challenging time we're currently in. And the yeah. answer is different for every business, of course. If you're in a travel-related business right now, wow. 
Yeah. You know, we talk about the obvious ones like cruise ships, but again, you think about hotels, you think about the little shops that are located around the hotels, the little restaurants in the Hawaii's of the world or in Canada, in all kinds of our tourism destinations. So very tricky. We're going to have to be supportive of each other by local. It sounds corny, but when we come out of this, I'm hoping everybody out there who's made it through, who has a little money, does things like supports the local restaurants, even stays a night at the local hotel tries to take advantage of the services offered by all the small business people because unquestionably they're suffering through this more economically than the rest of us. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it is really uh, much like you. I mean, we're getting, you know, had so many dialogues over the last few weeks and everyone sees it differently. And, you know, so if you look at, at Canada versus the USA, you know, obviously it appears that we are a little stronger. I mean, this is different in the sense that this time it is a health crisis rather than a financial crisis. Uh, but the market in general uh, and, and the stimulus, the massive stimulus the government has had to, uh, and I also, uh, you know, give them credit for, for an expedient, quick response. Uh, but the massive stimulant, you know, that, that we're seeing right now, uh, you know, how do we pay for it going forward? How is that going to affect us as, as, as Canadians? Um, you know, do we see a huge increase in taxes in the next few years? What does that do to sort of inflation and GDP? Any, any thoughts around that? Well, you know, it's interesting. And I'm not coming at this from a far right perspective at all. But the right. bottom line is, if you raise taxes significantly, you slow the economy so much that you often don't get bigger tax receipts. And so there's a balancing act that has to be found. I do think we'll see higher taxes and perhaps we should on certain people, et cetera. But I don't think that just going to super high taxes will solve our problem. We're going to have to grow way out of it. And we're going to have to have an environment that's conducive to growth. And therefore, we're going to have to support small business. We're going to have to support innovation. We're going to have to invest more in education. We're going to have to invest more in infrastructure. But of course, that means more expenditures early and compounds our problem on the deficit front. Our national deficit, our federal deficit, relative to other countries is actually quite reasonable. And we don't have the same unfunded liabilities problems that the United States has, for example. But many of our provinces are deep into the red. And of course, many of our individuals, private citizens, are really deep. Right. We've taken on a lot of debt over the last few years. We're not in a great position to weather the storm because of that. I mean, we've got a lot of people with a lot of debt. And so it's going to be interesting. I'm hoping that most of them can somehow get through over the next two or three months and recover and move on. But it'll be a challenge as to what happens going forward. Will we have inflation? I don't know. I'll tell you, when you look at the other mega trends out there from demographics to most importantly, all the things happening with innovation in the technology space, those are deflationary. Right. It's almost a tug of war. And those are very deflationary. It's not talked about enough. Every innovation that takes place in the technology space is deflationary. When you get in an Uber cab, you're getting in there because it costs less than a conventional cab. When you use Airbnb, it's the same type of thing. All the software that saves companies money in the B2B space, it all pulls prices down. That is a huge gravitational pull to lower prices. So maybe that can offset some of the inflation that may naturally come with all the money printing. I must say in the States where the Federal Reserve now has more or less been nationalized and is working hand in hand with the Treasury, I am worried. I really am. And when yeah. you see them start getting involved in the junk bond market, they're going to wow. new areas that Japan has gone to. I did not think they would do that. Even though they've been expanding their balance sheet, expanding their kind of intrusive approach to running the economy, I didn't think they would go that far. And I'm troubled by the fact in the States right now that nobody seems to want to pay a price for aggressive risk taking. And so you're seeing companies, we've talked to them before about all the buybacks and how they left themselves with no cash to deal with difficult times. But it's not just that, it's the excessive leverage. You and I were talking off air about the private equity space yeah. in the last three and four years. I mean, you had expanding multiples going from the old three to five that we used to see all the way up to seven, eight, nine, ten sometimes if it was strategic. But they were also using leverage of eight and nine times EBITDA. Like yeah. you've never seen anything like that. And again, if everything goes perfectly, it'll end up giving a great ROI. They'll be glad they did it. But even a slight disruption, and of course, this is a major disruption, will expose some of those people and put them in a very, very difficult spot. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we're going to talk about a lot of different things today and, and private equity is one and, and that is directly relatable to our industry. I mean, I look at, at one of our major competitors right now that, you know, uh, bought a lot of, you know, uh, operations over the last few years and, and we, we, we know they are absolutely leveraged uh, considerably and, and a time like this, you know, becomes uh, incredibly challenging. You know, I've said this a few times in the last couple of days, but Warren Buffett so famously coined the phrase that when the tide goes out, you get to see you swimming naked. And, uh, you know, and it's interesting right now. And, and I want to, I want to, one of the things I want to do today is I really want to talk about the basic principles of the original book in 1989, The Wealthy Barber and, you know, paying yourself first and spending second. And, but you talk about often that uh, we are consumed by consumption. 
And so if we've been so consumed by consumption and the rates have been so low for, for so many years now, we are seeing, uh, you know, this just exasperated right now. Why do you think it is as Canadians? And, and I'm, I'm asking this question because there's, there's many of us on this call that we get to look at this time as a reset and we get to go, okay, I'm going to make sure once I get through this that I am never going to put myself in a situation ever again where I'm exposed or I have, you know, not enough savings or I have limited runway, you know, for a unlikely event like this. So in your opinion, you know, is it just a matter of keeping up with the Joneses? Why have we as a nation been so consumed by consumption? And, and what are the steps to kind of break free of that? Well, great question. I mean, we, I think it is keeping up with the Joneses to some extent. And that, of course, has been compounded by social media. Right now, you look at people in their 20s and 30s, and they're on Instagram so often, they're seeing the very best parts of each other's lives. They right. trick nice house, the new renovations and so on and so forth, that they want the same type of thing. And it's natural to have that kind of competitive nature to want what others have. I mean, we're wired to do that to some extent. But what's interesting to me is that that obsession with possession has not paid off in increased happiness. In fact, I would argue most people who are falling into that camp are less happy. You know, the less you own often the better because all of those possessions are a weight. They really are. People like my parents who've lived very humble lives, they're not cheap at all. In fact, I would say they're quite generous, but they haven't cared that much about having the fancy granite countertops or the very newest in all the technologies. They've cared more about relationships, community involvement, etc. And to your earlier point, I think there may have been a positive reset caused by the COVID-19 situation where people are reassessing a little bit and saying, what's really important to me? I think it's friendships. Obviously, it's health. I think it's other relationships. I think I want to add value at work, all those types of things. But what's not necessarily important is the next $900 purse or the next da 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 and all of these different types of things. So maybe there'll be some positives come from that. Uh, who knows? I mean, I thought that a few times in the past and been a little bit disappointed. You know, credit has so been ubiquitously available in the last 20 and 30 years. And of course, interest rates have cooperated to the nth degree. Governments for uh, most of the world have tried to incentivize us to take on more debt because of course it keeps the economy rocking and rolling. Democracy for all of its tremendous advantages has one big disadvantage. The politician's primary objective is to get reelected. And yeah. to get reelected, they need a relatively strong economy and they'll do anything to get in the short term a strong economy, which means inducing us to take on more debt and spending and so on and so forth. And so we're trying to strike balances here. And I think COVID-19, obviously horrible for some families who've gone through health challenges, and others who've gone through financial ones, but for all of us, has given us a chance to think things through, to reset a little bit. I mean, you know how humble a life I live. I live in a very tiny house and I'm not a cheap guy at all. I give a lot of my money away, but I don't like all this stuff. I really don't. I, I don't enjoy owning it. In fact, I think it's a hassle factor. So again, we may see some people take a different attitude. And we talked earlier off air, you were making a good point about how a lot of the business people, including a lot of people who work in your organization, have been able to step back and take a look at their own business. What am I doing well? What am I not doing well? I told you a story off air about a colleague of mine who was saying that he has done an analysis of his marketing spend over the last three to five years and said, I can't believe I hadn't done that before. Because he said, even for a layman, he's not a marketing expert. It was very clear that certain expenditures were leading to no increase in sales. So obviously I've dropped those. And we've talked many times about how you get caught up working in your business instead of on it and taking two steps back and saying strategically, what do I need to do here? What ideas can I steal from other people that are working for them? What best practices, et cetera. We all get so caught up working. We don't have time to do that. Well, this sure. has given us a lot of time to yeah. maybe back and think and some people have taken full advantage of it but yeah so much is going to come of this again we were talking before about all the impact it's going to have on real estate i think commercial real estate in particular i think certain kinds of things may still continue to flourish we talked about storage off air etc but you think about retail commercial or even office space commercial in some places is mm -hmm. going to be challenged because a lot of the retail space that's not going to make it is going to have to come over and compete with conventional commercial going forward but also this new trend of working from home it's not for everybody. We're not going to mm -hmm. see a mass exodus from office buildings, but we're going to see more working from home. You bet. That yeah. trend has been accelerated for sure. I'm already talking to friends and they're leasing big spaces. We're talking tens of thousands of square feet. And they're saying, you know what? We might only look for 60 to 65% of that space going forward and rotate people in and out of the office for the savings. Funnily enough, by the way, many are saying they're getting more productivity from their workers at home than they got from them at work. There's a lot mm. of distractions at work. Mm. You know, we're always chatting and watching what others are doing. We're in this open environment now that people say is good for culture, but the statistics show is not so good for productivity. So this will play out in a very interesting fashion too going forward. 
Interestingly, residential real estate so far with limited data because sales are down has not been too effective. You've right. still got ultra low interest rates. In fact, I think most of us are convinced they're going to stay ultra low forever. Right, for, for a long time. A very, very long time. You and I have both been saying that for a long time. I've been saying that on stage for a decade. And I don't make predictions. But on mm. stage, I've been saying I'm making this one. Rates are not going up. I've seen right. too many <laughs> balance sheets. There's just no way. And you look at the debt levels now of corporations, governments in the developed world, individuals in Canada, et cetera. Rates can't go up much. They'll plunge us right back into recession and go right back down again. So we're looking at a low interest rate environment, and there's still a lot of demand. There's still housing shortages, especially detached homes in many, many areas. And real estate seems to be holding up relatively well. Now, this dragged on for months and months and months. Or so if we had a second... Uh, deal with it next year or things spiked unsurprisingly, et cetera. Who knows? But right now, residential real estate has uh, held up quite well. Yeah, it sure has. Uh, you and I were speaking earlier as well. I mean, I uh, was speaking to Phil Soper yesterday from uh, from Remax and I, or sorry, from Royal Page. Forgive me. Oh, uh, I, 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 well, I had Adam Contos on. I was talking to him. I had Adam Contos on last week, uh, CEO uh, Remax Worldwide, and yeah. uh, and Phil's on actually uh, next week. And anyway, we were uh, we were chatting, and uh, you know, early indications that you know uh, price dips right now are have only gone down about uh, a point and a half uh, on average. So that hasn't you know it hasn't sort of followed the trend, although listings are coming down. So we'll certainly uh, you know hear more about that next week. Uh, it's funny because we were talking about uh, consumption and, and Canadians' need for consumption and how this might be a reset. And in in your book, uh, you talked about a quote from the brilliant philosopher uh, Bertrand Russell. And he said, the most amazing misconception is that saving for the future requires a great sacrifice today and therefore lessens people's quality and enjoyment of life today. And what you just said is surprisingly, it is the exact opposite. People who actually finally figure that out and spend less because of course, spending begets spending. Another quote that you've used in the past, yeah, David. I, mean, I, I say that all the time. By the way, that quote was me, not Bertrand Russell, but he is very uh, sharp. Don't get me wrong. It was actually, yeah. that. and it's uh, so true. I've said, forever in a day that the conception out there is that if I'm going to save for the future, I have to make sacrifices to my life today, including joy. Mm -hmm. It's not the case. I have found over and over again, people who live within their means are happier today. Right. Yes, they're giving up a little bit on the spending front, but they have peace of mind knowing their future is better at hand, but also they train themselves to enjoy other things, not just things they're buying in the stores, but relationships and all those types of things. All of this sounds corny, but it's very much backed up by the data <laughs> yeah. and all the empirical evidence that I'm exposed to. And remember, I'm not on here saying, don't have fun, don't spend money. I'm not on here saying it that, but everything has its limits and you have mm. to do things within the context of affordability. And the line that you used earlier, the Buffett line about when the tide goes out, we see who's been swimming naked. Well, sadly, that's happening right now. And right. we're seeing a lot of people who stretch to buy everything on debt. And now one of the two in a couple, for example, has lost his or her job. And that puts them in a very challenging position, even with some of the government support. I do think a lot of people, of course, didn't have emergency funds. I understand they're difficult to build. No question is you're trying to also do RSPs, et cetera. And remember, lots of people don't need that. If you're working in certain industries, you know that your job is relatively secure. For example, if you're a teacher, you're in pretty good position on that front. And so it's not as important. But for some people, it's such an important first part of your financial plan because bad things like this happen. This is a certainly a unique one, but we do have recessions on occasion. And We'll have to see how this all plays out. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you know, we we you know the comment uh, you know that I've I've seen uh, written, and I think I saw it from you uh, originally came from Oscar Wilde, and it was I can resist everything except temptation. And I yeah. think right now we're quickly learning that we're going to have to use this time to to buckle down and 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 look at those areas in our life maybe that you know uh, we've realized that are not giving us a whole bunch of happiness. The joy is always in getting it. Chris Camp, my business partner, has said this forever. He goes, you know, he goes, the joy is always waiting for it and planning for it and, 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 and thinking that we're going to get it. And he goes, you know, almost everything in my life that I've eventually, you know, thought was so important to me and it was going to make me so happy, I've got it. And inside of six months, he said, you know, like it's just been diminished. The joy is there. And, you know, I think what makes most people joy is not having the pressure and the financial pressure. I look at, like your parents, I look at, at my parents and, and sadly my, uh, my dad died suddenly last January. But my mom and my dad, you know, they've never, we, we were very modest people, right? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things we couldn't do growing up, but we I had an amazing childhood. And, yeah, and same with mom's, me. Yeah, my mom today. Some family and the same thing. And, and your partner's a very sharp guy. Yeah. And I mean, Chris has done a very good job of handling his money and doing all those things. But he's right. Habituation is incredibly powerful. When you get something, you lose interest in it relatively 
relatively quickly in most cases. Mm -hmm. And it is the journey to getting it, including the pride that you get from making some sacrifices, mm -hmm. working hard. And again, all this sounds Tony Robbins like, but it's all true. Right, for sure. It really is. And again, we've gravitated to too much trying to define ourselves by what we own, look the best for other people, send signaling messages out mm -hmm. there about how well we're doing. And at the end of the day, that's not a path to happiness. It will be interesting to see if some of these good things, for example, reduced consumption, hurt us in the short term term though because we could have diminished consumer spending at the exact time we're trying to recover from this economic challenge you could have people pull back and this goes to the fear i spoke of earlier that a lot of service people have a lot of restaurateurs have is what happens if people do pull back a little bit and you combine that with the government restrictions that may well still be in place for six months a year 18 months they could have a lot of trouble rebounding on the top line and so again there's a lot of trouble out there and even in the tech space you know, we're always talking about the positive tech stories right now, like Zoom, the technology we're currently using. And of course, Amazon has been a big beneficiary of everybody moving online. But a lot of the tech companies are scuffling now to gain access to financing. It'll be tougher for startups right now. You're certainly seeing more demanding VCs in the area of companies that have five to 10 year histories, but haven't yet been able to ramp up the top line much. And a lot of the VCs are saying, hey, you've been around too long now. You better prove it in the next 12 to 24 months or you're going to have trouble gaining access to financing. Well, they're fairly big employers in certain cities, Ottawa, Toronto, Kitchener, right. Waterloo, et cetera. So all this has to be watched going forward. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah. So with that in mind, if I'm just a, you know, uh, one of, you know, 36, 37 million Canadians right now and, and I'm sitting here and, you know, I'm nervous, uh, you know, we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, you know, we're, we're an average Canadian family. What are the steps, David, that you think that I should be thinking about or, or that I could be doing to, to prepare myself, uh, you know, for, for this, this COVID-19 crisis and what are the steps I can do to, you know, sort of dig ourselves out? Well, I wish it was easy and I could give you a checklist of three or four things. But as I was saying earlier, every family situation, every business situation is so different right now. And right. frankly, for a lot of us, you're just trapped. You are where you are. You're in your house right now. You're under more or less stay at home rules. There's not a lot you can do. Now, again, remember a good percentage of people out there in Canada are drawing a full income right now or if not a full income, only a slightly diminished income. In fact, I'll be honest, I've had many, many, many friends tell me that they've been saving a fair amount of money over the last six weeks because mm -hmm. they're drawing their conventional income, but they're spending less than they've ever spent. Right. They've been trips canceled, they're not going out to the internet, not buying gas, that's most of us. And so a lot of people are gonna get through this financially relatively well. It's what do we do to that group of vulnerable financial people, and again, the small business people leading the way, and certain employee groups right behind them. We've got to help those people. I will say, again, the Canadian government not only acted relatively quickly to their credit, but also used a system that got the money into people's hands pretty quickly, whereas in the States, they've had a lot of problems on the execution front. But right now, I think a lot of the lessons we've already spoken about what people have to focus on, and there could be some opportunities out there, too, if you're an entrepreneur. I mean, certainly there'll be some assets come for sale. It's interesting. I'd love to get your opinion on what you think of all the Airbnb challenges in Toronto. As you know, that marketplace, <sighs> Toronto marketplace has been picked up by a lot of Airbnb people. And it's, it's fascinating to me because they were putting the down payments down, fully leveraged beyond the mm -hmm. down payment, obviously. And, and they have no income coming in right now. And they're looking for bailouts. They've gone to the government. My opinion is, and you can argue with me, I wouldn't give them a bailout. Right. And I'll tell you why. There's finite money available. We have to, no matter how much we care, no matter how much we're trying to get people through this, there's not an infinite amount available. You have to give it to the places of the biggest need. The Airbnb buyer doesn't have employees. Okay, maybe a small property management involvement, but doesn't have employees. And plus the asset doesn't go away if something bad happens. It stays, unlike a business, which can actually disappear, including the value it adds, the employment it creates, the tax base, et cetera. So I think that they're going to have to be left on their own, but there's no doubt in my mind after seeing some of these stats that many of them, if this doesn't straighten up quickly, aren't gonna make it through. Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, I mean, I look at that market and I think uh, that's one of the greatest exposures that we're gonna see uh, in the market as well is, is the VRBOs and the Airbnbs. And, you know, there's, there's many uh, people in North America that, you know, owning those rental properties is a, is a huge part of their uh, portfolio. And, you know, like so many, I mean, you know, they need that rental income in order to support you know, service those, uh, those mortgage payments. Uh, so I think that as soon as we start to see graduated back to work programs, I think you're going to see the listing inventory, which is very low right now, uh, come back very quickly. And I think there's going to be pressure, uh, especially if this goes a few months longer on a lot of those people. And I think that you're going to see uh, some prices come down in that segment. I'll give you just a, a personal example. 
I'm not sure if you know this, David, or not, but I'm um, the largest shareholder in a, in a company called Whistler Bungie. It's been in Whistler for 16 years. Right. You jump off the bridge and, and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, of course, we closed, you know, Whistler Bungie down about five weeks ago now. Whistler Village is an absolute ghost town right now. And of course, yeah. Whistler Village was supported by, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, young workers from all over the world. They come in there, they spend a few years in Whistler, they're ski lifties, yeah. you know, they work for Whistler Bungie. So the rental market, which was, you know, very, it was so tight. It was, you know, there was nothing available. It was super expensive. Well, all these young guys and young people have just gone home. They yes. said, I don't care about my lease. I, I don't sue me. I'm in Australia. <laughs> yeah, go you know back to mean? Australia. Right. See ya. And yeah. uh, so it's amazing. So there's so much rental revenue in Whistler, right? Or sorry, rental opportunity in Whistler. All the, the, the prices to, to rent these condos uh, have dropped, in, have, you know, have dropped uh, dramatically. Uh, and, and it's amazing because, you know, I expect in the next little while, you're going to see some opportunity in, in Whistler because largely a lot of these people who own these have bought them as an investment, are highly levered, right? Need that cash flow. And who knows when that's coming back, right? And, you know, it's, and that's, I think, you know, one of the, one of the most important things. I don't think, you know, many of us have realized, uh, you know, that a pandemic like this could ever happen. Right. I and, agree. And I mean, nobody can plan around revenue falling to zero in, right. in everybody's defense. So everybody out there who's saying, hey, I could never have seen this coming. To some extent, they're right. We hadn't seen it since 1917. And none of us, of course, can remember that. And so, I mean, I still feel for all these people. Don't get me wrong. But certain people can't be bailed out. Like on the going back to the Airbnb, I didn't know that many people were going the Airbnb route over with the rental units over a conventional rental. I didn't re realize that until I started reading all these articles. I mean, that's become a huge right. thing in Toronto, especially. Yeah, and no, it's, it's a lot of them will convert and start going back to more conventional rentals where they've got people locked in for a year or two and they take away some of the nasty surprise potential. Well, I mean, I think, uh, I think initially, uh, I mean, I think initially that will happen, right? People will just want to get some stability in there and they want to get some certainty. Um, you know, I think it will eventually go back and, and you'll continue continue to see, uh, you know, people doing these short term rentals because the returns are, are, are so much higher than, than month to month. Uh, but I think initially, uh, you know, just giving people confidence to service the debt, uh, you know, they're going to go to a year, you know, year by year rental. So, I mean, who knows? Uh, my crystal ball is, you know, no different than your crystal ball. It's actually probably much worse than your crystal ball. But uh, we, we, you know, we, uh, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's interesting times. One of the things that I, I want to I want to talk about is uh, the equity markets. So you know, I think most of you know this already about David, but David is a very very long term uh, astute investor and and is involved uh, in many many different industries and and markets. Uh, he's not only he's not only an author and a speaker, uh, and I know you watch the equity markets incredibly close. You and I have spoken you know before on that, and we were just sharing a couple of weeks ago that we were buying much of the same stuff. Um, so tell me your thoughts on the equity market right now. Is this a opportunity of a lifetime to step in from, you know, from, you know, some great companies that have been, you know, sort of artificially damaged uh, or is this a risk? That would be my first question. Well, it, first off, it was funny when you and I happened to speak two or three weeks ago because we were doing almost the exact same thing. Yeah. And I'm not a trader. I never move in and out of stocks. I'm not that sharp. I tend to buy things when I think they represent good value and hold them for the long term. But at that particular point, that was when the markets had clapped back in mid-March and there was some just screaming opportunities with Canadian bank stocks and a few others. And you and I jumped in and maybe should have helped, but we kind of did a little trading. But I always keep some of those as core positions too. I mean, when you look at the Canadian banking right. industry, it's an oligopoly in an essential service that's very well run by very smart people and to some extent fully supported by the Canadian government. You add all that up and that's a pretty nice package. And the dividend yields are outstanding right now. And yeah, they may run into trouble with the oil patch. Mm -hmm. They also don't have the benefit going forward of interest rates declining from 20 to zero, which is essentially what we've seen over the last 20 and 25 years. But I still think they're very stable, well-run companies. I think in general, there are some good opportunities there now, but, but, it all depends on how quickly this passes. I think if this were to go another three or four months and we couldn't get people released back into a more conventional life, and certainly we won't go back to what we were doing, but you know, slowly taking some of the rules off, then the markets may take one more leg down. And I'm not very good at this. I'm not a great trader. I'm more of a long-term investor. Yeah, as am I. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that really we could have one more leg down. Again, if there's some nasty surprises on the COVID front, and there well could be, we could have it come back. 
in the fall or in December of next year. I know that the CDC people are calling for that today and saying it could be a major threat. We're also worried about whether you develop antibodies quickly or whether you can continue to infect people. There's all kinds of moving parts that, again, I'm not a scientist and I can't grasp all of them, but they'll impact the markets too. So you have to be watching which different types of stocks. I think for down the road, and again, I think most of the listeners are better just to use broad-based ETFs or index funds, keep their costs low, and then be very well diversified. But if you are looking at individual sectors, I think in the next three to 10 years, infrastructure plays are going to have some tailwinds because I think governments are going to look for ways to jumpstart the economy. And as you know, in Canada and the States, we need a fair amount of infrastructure spending. And so I think some of those plays could benefit, of course. And then I think that really, I haven't talked about this on stage or in interviews for probably 20 years. I tend not to get too specific, but I think having a little gold in your portfolio is not a bad idea. Right. And that's gold's had a major run. So you're buying high. It's at 1700 ish US. But I think at the end of the day, when you see this level of central bank involvement throughout the world, having a little insurance policy with gold is probably not a bad idea. Now we may end up fighting a deflationary environment because of the things we spoke of earlier and gold has fared well during some deflationary times. It may not this time, who knows? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where it's going to go, but I think having it as an insurance policy, at least a little bit that old, we used to talk about 10% of your portfolio, maybe not even that much, three to five, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of Canadians have zero mm -hmm. in precious mm -hmm. metals. And I think again, with the central bank level of involvement now, that may not be prudent. So we'll have to see going forward. We talked off air, you were saying you're getting asked a lot about leverage and people right. should people more to buy stocks and it's an interesting question because you do have stocks down from their highs 20 25 and 30 percent i mean in mm -hmm. the states people are saying oh the markets are only down 20 percent but it's very misleading because the big five or six stocks you know the facebook's the netflix's etc and of course uh, uh amazon have done so so well that they've given the market a different look than it really has most stocks in the states are down 25 30 35 percent a lot of stocks in canada as well and you can borrow money very inexpensively right now obviously with interest rates where they are so a lot of people are tempted on the leverage front and i get it you could have another leg down but you've got to make sure you do it within reason and you have to make sure that psychologically you're the kind of person that can handle challenging market times with borrowed money because if you think it's stressful having your own money go down in value, right. <laughs> bank yeah. money go down yeah. in value. And unfortunately, in my early part of my career, when leverage first got hot, I saw so many people who couldn't withstand the volatility when they had the board money. And they cashed out at the exact wrong time in many instances. But if you're a true long-term investor, I think that it's a time you may want to take a look at that again. But I hesitate to say that because people often go too far. And you've got to do it within reason. You've got to keep it as something you can definitely handle. You know you're going to have the cash flow to pay down the debts and do your other savings and so on and so forth. So there's a lot to be careful about. I actually have a chapter on that in the second book and why I am so guarded. And I'm guarded, even though I'm a math-based guy, I'm guarded because psychologically I saw what it did to a lot of people during other times and it hasn't worked out that well. But I think you and I talked when we first met, we first became friends back 2008, 2009. Boy, a lot of people did it then and obviously did tremendously well. They bore yeah. the low interest rates when the markets were also down. I mean, I had a couple of colleagues who bought and they just bought Canadian bank stocks with it, with the leverage money. And they, they took away the currency risk, therefore, and they kept, uh, you know, dividend paying companies that were paying a higher dividend rate than what they're borrowing at because they were able to gain access to credit relatively inexpensively. So it's something that can be looked at, but something you have to be very, very careful of. You have to be focusing long term and you have to know yourself psychologically. Yeah, excellent question. So excellent answer on that, David. Thank you. It's funny because we talk about, you know, those opportunities in the equity markets today. I mean, I think we're going to be surprised when you think some very large, what most people consider very stable and, and risk-free, how in fact uh, they're exact opposite. They're, they're, they're highly levered. They have more debt than ever before. They look good. They look large. They're, you know, these huge corporations and I think they're exposed. So the key, and, and we've talked about that before, obviously, is, is large, defensible, uh, you know, institutions, companies with strong balance sheets with, you know, with, with limited debt. Um, I just think you have to be so careful right now. So a lot of the small you companies. You said all that very well. And you know where you see a really good example of that is a lot of the small cap U.S. stocks have really been beaten up. And they were already trailing in terms of overall performance, small cap value to its historical numbers, but also relative to the rest of the marketplace. And so I've had friends call me and say, I'm going to look at that uh, different spot. And I've already found a couple I really like. And the stock is down 70% mm -hmm. from its high. And it's down 60% during COVID. Well, when I've taken quick glances at them, their balance sheets are messes. Right. And so remember, they can go down another 100% from what you just paid if they don't get through it all. 
And mm. really, they were in a couple, a couple of them were in a position where if they didn't get government financing, if they didn't get government, they weren't going to make it. Well, I'm not mm. going to take that kind of risk. I don't know if the government's going to bail them out at all. They, they often don't with the small ones. So your point's well taken. You've got to know what you're doing. That's why for a lot of people, you're better if you want to get back in the market now or if you want to add to your holdings, you're better to do it through a broad-based ETF or index fund. Not only do you keep the cost low, but the diversification gives you some protection against some of these not doing well. Because again, off air, you and I are both saying that a lot, the vast majority of companies will make it through this. Mm -hmm. And five years from now, some will be thriving, obviously. But because this is so severe, there will be a couple companies that surprise us. As you just said, companies we thought were in excellent position and just had too much leverage. Or they had too much leverage and were affected by the new normal when we come out of this. And, you know, again, think about anything travel related. Like yeah. It's scary. I mean, are you going to jump on a plane again the second that the uh, rules are relaxed? I don't think a lot of people will. We've talked about the cruise lines, all those types of businesses, the hotel business. I mean, these are all challenging times for all of them. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I really hope we don't have that second big spike. I know I've referred to it two other times already, but I'm worried that not only will it be horrible for people's health, and that's obviously our primary concern, but psychologically, I think a second big spike, one that necessitated us going back to some of the current rules of staying in place, et cetera, I think psychologically that can be very difficult and very challenging for markets and really make it difficult for companies to access capital. And of course, at the end of the day, that's so, so important is who can still access capital right now? And of course, as you and I've known forever, a lot of times the people who don't need the capital are the ones and ones who can access it. Right. <laughs> they, need it they can't get it. Right. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's interesting. I just had a, a couple questions that that uh, that came in that I want to just maybe get your your thoughts on uh, really quick. Um, you're talking about the demand side of the equation right now. What about the supply side that will you know that will affect the economy as well? How uh, might we prepare or mitigate for that? Yeah, you know it's a big issue. In fact, it's funny. It's hard to go back six weeks in time because this six weeks has seemed like 20. Right. <laughs> but remember at the start, people were talking more to the questioner's credit. They were talking more about the supply problems because right. obviously a tremendous number of firms now are buying out of China. And a lot of people are having things manufactured there. And there's been supply issues, supply chain issues. You may even, frankly, have a lot of companies want to bring back their production now, make it more expensive, but you'll save on shipping costs. The other thing with – I'm getting off track a little bit, but this is an important point – I do think you'll see some manufacturing brought back because people have learned that just-in-time inventory has its own set of dangers, that obviously shipping costs matter. But the other thing is so much manufacturing is going automated now. The labor cost advantage that the Far East has, China, Vietnam, et cetera, is shrinking because labor is a lesser and lesser part of the overall cost picture with the automation. And I think you may see a refocus on building a refocus mm -hmm. on manufacturing in North America. You're gonna bring those types of things back and it'll be interesting to watch. I think we need to build things to be perfectly honest. So I think that's probably a good thing, but the supply part of it, I can't give a good answer to, not because I'm being evasive, but because it depends so much on the specific company involved and the specific industry. Some of my friends are having no issues on that front. I have one friend who may be wiped out. He may mm -hmm. be done because he cannot get his supply. Well, you can't go six months with no revenue. There's no, no. business model that's no. built to tolerate that particular problem. And so I don't have a good answer to that. The numbers out of China, as you may know, in the last couple of weeks have been frightening. And they tend yeah. not to give the most transparent and honest numbers. And they've still been frightening. But the logic makes sense. They're saying, well, we can't manufacture a lot right now because there's nobody to buy it. All the countries you traditionally export to are shut down in essence. And so buying has gone way down. Hey, I just want to jump over to something. That was a good question. Sure. Right? I wish I had a better answer for it. But you mentioned something off air that really caught me. You were saying how this has sped up the move towards online buying. And you mm -hmm. gave a couple quick examples. I completely agree with you. It's not a deep thought. I mean, you can definitely. <laughs> but, but I agree with you because you gave great examples. And I have a couple for you. Like people like my father now buying Amazon. Yeah. Right. I'm buying through Amazon. But a better one is I have a female friend who said to me that she had told people for years, I will never buy a clothing item online ever. Mm. And she said to me last week, I will never not buy a clothing item online again. Now, Crazy. That's the kind of transition we're seeing because she started doing it and realized you can buy three sizes. Mm -hmm. And you pick the one that fits and it's so easy to send them back now because they send you the return box. It's so easy to order. You just do this. You've got the one click, all of these, you can shop. It's kind of fun. And of course, this is before we get all of the 3D modeling and everything that's going to come along with virtual reality and all those types of things. I'll tell you, this is really hastening the demise of physical retail. Well, it so sure is. I mean, all that reluctancy. 
all that reluctancy that everyone had, as I said, my wife is ordering groceries online now. She is, you know, what shopping online. Things are being delivered to the door. I mean, you know, we're, we're in our 50s and we had never, ever done that. We had all, you know, wanted okay. to start doing that. And, you know, we would do the odd purchase here and there, but we were doing everything. And guess what, David? So much of it is so easy. You know, so you're not gonna go back, right? So, you're and it's gonna go back, and no, it's like I, this I you retail. Would you like to own a retail store? Right oh, now? My and God. the problem is, remember, to some extent, they all feed off each other. I mean, obviously, in a the mall, they do because of traffic. And if you have X number in a mall, go under it, hurts everybody else because you've lost traffic, you're no longer the destination draw, etc. We're gonna see that compounding effect coming on, but it, they were already in trouble, as evidenced by their stock prices and the claim bankruptcies and Amazon's ascent but their problems have been compounded. They've been brought forward now at a quicker pace because of COVID-19. I'm actually quite surprised at how much my friends, to your wife's point, have enjoyed the whole process. Yeah. They like buying online. They think yeah. it's actually kind of cool and easy and everything else. And it's so much, e so very interesting to watch that retail space, but I do not feel good about it. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. One of the things that we haven't uh, dipped into right now uh, is the energy sector and, uh, and oil. And, and of course, we are you know, we have seen, you know, uh, things in the last few days that no one in the world ever thought possible. <laughs> I mean, you know, like negative oil prices and, uh, and just how under pressure uh, the energy sector is. Um, you know, I mean, we rely on, 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 on energy, of course. I mean, sooner or later, this is going to slow down. We're going to get back to work and, you know, and ferries and airplanes are going to be moving again and people are going to be filling up gas and traveling more and there's going to be a, a higher demand. Uh, what's your take on oil right now? And, you know, from your perspective, is, is oil something that we should be having in our uh, portfolio? Well, it's very funny because last night online, reading all the articles, I said to a friend of mine, this is the most negative I've seen people about any commodity or any investment opportunity ever. It's probably a decent buy. 98% yeah. of people, 99% of people last night, from the experts to the neophyte, were anti-oil. It's got everything against it, et cetera, et cetera. And that often presents a fairly good, I probably shouldn't say that because I don't know what it's doing today, but I wouldn't right. be surprised if it had a good bounce today just because all the negativity was out right. there. What happened in the futures market the other day with the forward contract was stunning. I mean, I thought it might go slightly negative because of storage challenges and everything else, but I didn't see it going there. Mm -hmm. And you've got the USO ETF and they own 25% of the futures trading, et cetera. This is a formula for those types of challenges. I think at some point you're gonna see the same thing in the gold market, but in reverse. In the gold market, you're gonna see a lot of the people who own the paper saying, I want the gold. And there's not gonna be enough gold to do it, to be perfectly honest. And you could see gold prices go up significantly if that kind of buyer squeeze, if that kind of demand squeeze happens. But I, I do think that we're not getting rid of oil anytime quickly, we're still gonna have. Oop, David, did I lose you? Hello. Okay, let's just see what happened. See if we can, I'm sure he'll just, uh, for those on the call, uh, please stay on. I'm sure David will dial back in. He must just got a frozen screen. Just give it about 60 to 90 seconds, please. Well, so far, this has been incredible. He's such a smart guy, and he's just so engaging. I have some chats coming in here. Let me have a look while we're uh, waiting. Can everyone still hear me? You bet we can. Okay. It was only David that we lost. Let's, uh, are you, have you sent him a text here to see if he's, uh, there he is. There he is. Got we her. got him. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> there you, you go. Me. We got you back now. We can hear you. Well, I don't know what happened there. I'm now on the floor where I belong. I, I thought, <laughs> wow, Gary really does not like this answer. Yeah, it's over. See ya. He hung up Zoom on me. But yeah. going back to talking about the oil, I mean, there's still going to be usages for it. And we can talk about the environmental challenges. It certainly doesn't have tailwinds. There's no question. But I think that it was oversold. Uh, into yesterday, et cetera. And I think that it may have some very tough times, by the way, ahead in the next few months, because obviously we're still going to see less driving, less flying. You've got an oversupply situation and all these different types of things. Like a lot of the trends we're talking about, it seems like COVID-19 economically made a lot of the trends that were already in place speed up. Mm. That's, that's probably the biggest single thing it's done. It's pulled a lot of these things forward with great pace. That all being said, I still think energy does have some possibilities in portfolios, but 
Who yeah. knows? I, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you, you know, right now. yeah, we can all lose money, uh, you know, together here uh, as a worst case scenario. I mean, I stepped in yesterday and bought a little bit of uh, BP, a little bit of Chevron, a little bit of Exxon and a little bit of uh, Synovus. Uh, you know, just because they're, the prices are so compressed. And, and, well, they are. And to, and to your credit, I mean, yesterday I said, I don't know if I've seen that higher percentage of experts negative on the same thing at one time. And that's mm -hmm. normally an excellent buy opportunity, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. It really is. So good for you. And we'll see how it plays out. But it's tough long term. And we're going to come up with more and more innovations in the solar space. In fact, they're working on a new type of solar cell. And it seems to be almost on the Moore's Law pace right now where solar costs are having uh, every two and three years. There's just a lot of incredibly smart people working in that space. And I think that the conventional uh, energy industry is going to go through a lot of difficult times the next two decades. But again, in the short term, it may well have been oversold the last couple of days. And I actually sat and watched what was happening in the futures market two days ago, because I mean, I've never seen anything, anything yeah. like it. It was absolutely yeah. wacky. I find myself, this is, this is, I've never done this before, but in the last couple of weeks, I find myself waiting for Bloomberg Europe to open, right? On channel 54, I think it is. I watch it every night. I get to see the European market just as I'm going to bed and how it yeah, opens up. Because it's all happy. Even if you're not trading, even if you're not yeah. investing this stuff, it's fascinating. I mean, we yeah. are living through a time that we may never see again. I hope we never see again. Yeah. And again, the ripple impacts, I'm not sure we can kind of figure out going forward. Anybody who comes on to some of these shows, you see it occasionally on maybe CNBC and, and tells you this is exactly how it's going to play out. That person's nuts. Yeah. All right. There's just too many yeah. moving parts. We never know how it's going to play out during the most smooth of times. So of course we can't yeah. know when you're dealing with this type of thing. So yeah, no, it's interesting times, but the oil one's going to be fun to watch. What has it done today out of curiosity? Do you have any idea? I haven't even opened it up today. I, uh, I looked at it this morning. It had bounced, right? It had bounced uh, as of uh, when I was going to bed last night, it had bounced, but I've been up early kind of preparing for this call. So uh, much to your, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's bounced and anyone who's on the call, uh, feel free to send me a message. I won't, you know, get sidetracked and look right now. But uh, no, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a, it, it's a, you know, it's a critical service. It's a critical, uh, you know, essential for us. And and it's been hammered more more than ever. And I, I think just on the on the demand side, as we get out of this COVID nineteen, there's going to be some sort of, you know, uh, increase there. Obviously, I mean, this is just unheard of times. Um, so, so David, we've, we've covered a lot of stuff and, uh, and I just, I'm enjoying every second of it. I mean, the feedback that I'm getting from, from our, our listeners, uh, has just been incredible. I, I really, there's, there's a lot of people, I really, maybe in the, in the next kind of 15 minutes, I want to just, I mean, I cannot just, you know, uh, say clearly enough how, how powerful 30 years later, the book, The Wealthy Barber, and The Wealthy Barber Returned, actually, which wasn't written as a uh, as a as a wow. as a novel, right? Uh, but it was it was wonderful. I mean, these were life lessons. These were simple principles that have withstood the test of time. I remember in in 1989, I graduated in 1986 uh, when someone you know gifted this to me, and right. I read it. I consumed it in in you know in less than 24 hours. It just felt like, you know what, I, I had a plan. It felt like I had some simple steps to take. And there is, there is nothing in that book that is outdated. That is all uh, as important as ever and as relevant as ever. So I want to talk about some of those principles uh, and your thoughts on it. And if I miss any principles um, that you want to add to, feel free to jump, jump in. But I think the most powerful principle was, was pay yourself first, right? Spend second, right? Uh, as opposed to really hit hard on that over the years in fact that's kind of what i hope i'm remembered for more than anything else yeah, you are pay yourself first take it off the top if you leave it to uh human nature you're going to lose that we will spend it you have to have a plan and, and frankly i've never been a huge believer in budgeting interestingly a lot mm -hmm. of people assume i would be but i'm not because i found that budgets easily are overwhelmed by human nature and the desire to spend today and you better just take it out and get rid of it but in the last 10 to 15 years, of course, I mentioned earlier, credits become ubiquitously available, lines of credit, credit cards, et cetera. And what I'm meeting with now, a lot of young people who've done a pretty good job of saving the 10%, the 15% off the top, but unfortunately they've matched it on the liability side by running up huge debts, not huge debts for real estate and things that are advancing in value, but just huge lifestyle debts, et cetera. So they're carrying credit card debt, they're carrying line of credit debt, they borrow from their parents, whatever. So you've got to make sure that if you're doing the right thing on the saving end, you're not wiping out all those advantages by overspending using credit on the other end. But that's still the fundamental principle of the wealthy barber is pay yourself first, save 10 to 15%, start as young as you possibly can. 
and then get it into vehicles that won't go straight up. I don't know any, but they'll compound over time and the overall rates of return will be quite competitive. Very simple message, but you know, now at age 58, I'm able to sit by and talk to dozens of people a month, hundreds in some cases, of people who've taken the principles of the book and actually done them. People like you who stuck, got it in 1989 and stuck with it and did all those things. It's absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. The money they've accumulated in their lifetimes by just following those very basic principles. I, by the way, didn't invent any of them. In fact, with the exception of the anti-budgeting stance, the wealthy barber was a lot of the conventional advice that was out there in the marketplace already. The problem is the books that were trying to deliver it were too dry. Right. They, were, they weren't fun. And the average person just wouldn't embrace them. So I thought turning it into a novel format made sense. And I also thought having the central character be somebody everybody could identify with. He wasn't a doctor. He was a teacher. He wasn't a math guy at all. In fact, he was horrible with math. He hadn't started investing yet. He knew very little about it. So the average reader went, if he can learn, I can learn with him. And then I introduced his sister as being another character and his best friend and kind of you grew with them. I actually like the second book better, interestingly, because I think the second book 11 years ago got ahead of its time in terms of talking about the psychology of all the decisions we make and some of the weaknesses and some of the things we have to address, et cetera, and the philosophies you have to bring to all this. It's not just about numbers. It's really about the narratives you create for yourself and the way you kind of look at the world and look at everything else. And I, I, I really quite like the second book. It sounds funny to say about your own book, but I really yeah. do. I've read the second book many times. It's funny. I wrote The Wealthy Barber, and I'm not sure until a few years ago I'd ever reread it, but I've read the second book five or six times. Yeah. It's interesting because a couple times I've actually said, oh, that's a good point. I've learned <laughs> that's that. a good book. Who wrote this thing? <laughs> so I, I, uh, oh, well, I'm actually, what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do today on this call, guys, on my, on my Facebook uh, page, uh, Gary Morris, the first uh, 50 people that, that uh, you know, post a message to me about uh, whether or not you enjoyed the program with David today, I'm going to have Tara send you guys out a, a copy of the second book. Uh, so uh, feel free that that starts uh, anytime and I'll, I'll go in order. Uh, David, the, the, if they, didn't, if they say they didn't enjoy it, you know, yeah, I'm, don't, not as keen. I'm not as keen on sending the book, but we'll still yeah, do it. Yeah, don't tell anybody. Don't send Chris one. Yeah, and exactly. He has mastered all of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other thing that you talk about, the other principle, uh, very, uh, you know, clear principle. And we talked about it a little bit today already, but just is, you know, living within your means. Any comments on that? Well, again, it's, it's tougher to do than ever because you've got high housing costs, as you know, you've got a lot of kids coming out of university with student debt now, more in Canada than we've ever had, not like the US, but still a problem. And so again, with that money that's left after those two things, it's tougher and tougher to live within your means. And then you've got the Instagram problem, which is not insignificant. It really isn't. People seeing others and the lives they're living and only seeing their best moments really does drag up your spending. That being said, there's lots of ways to do it. And I mean, one of the best ways to do it is to make sure you don't buy anything quickly. You don't buy anything impulsively. I'm not talking about a chocolate bar. I'm talking about any significant purchase. Put 24 hours between the time you've decided, yes, I need this, and the time you actually go get it. Sounds very basic, but I'm telling you, it works. You know, it really does. You know, I talked in the book about Greta Podleski, the Looney Spoons author, and the success she's had in her career, but she had no self-discipline when it came to buying things like shoes. She said she's literally addicted to shoes. And then a couple years later, she told me, "I, I don't have a problem with it anymore. Yeah. And I said, well, how did you do that? I was expecting some sort of deep answer. And she said, well, I don't go to shoe stores anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the basic answers make a tremendous amount of sense. You know, yeah. they really do. You just take away the ability to give in to temptation. Tougher, by the way, with online now. You are always at a store now because you're always holding your phone or computer. And so people can easily go and fall in love with something or just do a one click and all of a sudden it's in their hands. So it's not easy to do any of this. I've never said that it's easy to live within your means and master the psychology of all this. But I truly am hoping to go back to our earlier point that COVID-19 has served as a reset a little bit. And what's important to me? Where do I truly get my joy? I'll tell you the biggest benefit of all this. Lots of sad things have come of this, but the biggest benefit, I think that all of us are going to take fewer things for granted. Mm -hmm. I think that you and I will be excited to get together for lunch now. Mm-hmm. that we, it's, we just took all those good things in life for granted, going for walks with friends, getting out to a golf course with your buddies, having dinner with you, all of these types of things. They're a great part of our everyday lives, but we don't appreciate them enough because they are part of our everyday lives. Habituation does set in. Now that they've been taken away from us, you tend to reflect a little bit and go, wow, I, I had it pretty good. I'm lucky to have the friends and family I do. I'm certainly lucky to live in Canada, a wonderful nation by almost any measure. Not perfect. We always have room for improvement, places to grow, but this is a pretty darn good spot to leave. And I've talked to live. I've talked to a lot of people who have said, you know what? I've, I'm thinking better now. 
I'm two steps back because of COVID and I'm realizing I'm a pretty lucky person. And they've had a strong desire to get involved in the community, to give back. In fact, a lot of people have been frustrated during all this because they wanted to volunteer, but there's no great way to do it because of social distancing. Yes, they've given money and they've tried to do those types of things, but I think you're going to see a higher level of community involvement going forward too. Maybe this is just, uh, you know, some optimistic viewpoint I have distorted by a few healthy and positive phone calls, but I really don't think so. I think that some ways this is going to make us a better world and we're going to pay more attention to people in need. And we're also going to maybe look at compensation plans a little bit differently and look at things like minimum wage, et cetera. I think a lot of us have had to examine our views on all the subjects and go, yeah, there, there's some good points there. And how do we make sure everybody's sharing the prosperity that really the world's enjoyed in the last 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah. Amen on those last comments. I, uh, I made a post last night and I said, use this time of separation to become closer than ever before. Right. I think it's, you know, we're seeing it at home. We're seeing it with the relationship with our kids. We're, we're seeing it, you know, in so many areas of our life. Um, we've had all of our uh, mortgage professionals who are, who are the, the very best in the Canadian mortgage space, uh, you know, uh, reach out, spend this time just to connect and, and, and be proactive and, and send valuable links, uh, information, federal uh, program uh, links to, to, you know, our past customers and our referral sources. And, and they're so grateful because, you know, uh, it's, there's never been a better time to, to sort of reconnect. And I think sometimes in a busy, you know, crazy world, we lose that perspective. And, and we talk about the, the simplicity of life and, and how much I think that this is going to trigger us to just, you know, bring that to the forefront and remember it. And, you know, and I hope it's going to be the start of uh, many great habits and, you know, time to, you gave the example of reviewing, you know, advertising or your message to community or, or how you'd be involved in community or the areas of your business, maybe that, you know, haven't paid you a, a quality return, but you've been doing them because you haven't simply made time to reflect and, and review them. You've just, you've just, you know, like kept doing them for a long time. Well, this gives you, you know, that kind of opportunity. Um, well, a couple of your guys, something interesting. A couple of them just reached out to the clients to say, hi, yeah. how are you doing? Didn't send them anything, didn't do anything. Just said, hey, I'm thinking about you. How are you doing? Well, that's always a good move. Mm -hmm. I mean, selfishly, it's a good move because it uh, deepens the relationship, no doubt about it. But it's also the right thing to do. Your right. client, you should care about. And this is a challenging time. And some people are battling extreme mental health issues because of the isolation or because of ill health members, et cetera. So reaching out to them can only be a positive. It doesn't take a lot of time. And I think that we all should do a lot more of that. And I think all this, I'll tell you what I found interesting about all this. And we were talking about sharing links and all those th types of things. You know, there's too much good information out there. <laughs> to find the good information. Now there's so many good writers, yeah. so many people with interesting perspectives on things and everybody's sending me all the links. I actually stressed out trying to read it all. Right, because exactly. It's so difficult to stay on top of it. And I'm finding right now I'm taking in so much information. I don't think I'm thinking quite as well that I need to take in less information and I need to give myself time to digest it and, you know, go for a walk, et cetera, and think it through, get a little separation and figure out, okay, I've learned some things, but now how do I take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. What changes do I make in my life because of that? Because again, the information can swallow you up. There's so much of it. It's interesting because uh, last week on this call, we had uh, a good friend of mine, Darren Hardy, uh, one of yeah, the, by the way, yeah. Oh, you watch it. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, uh, just uh, such great messaging and uh, a very, very talented individual. And he said exactly what you just said, right? He had said, consume less, study more, right? Like there's so many places to go and there's so much information right now that, you know, consuming actually, you know, can just get you drunk, right? You have to. I'm guilty of that. Like that's a weakness of mine. I'm such an information junkie that I've gone too far lately that I'm just reading nonstop, but I'm not, as I say, thinking. I'm not really processing it all. And what I'm finding is, therefore, I'm not remembering to the extent I used to. So I need to take in information, yes, but less of it. Try to get a little more selective and then give myself time to mesh it with my own life. Think, what am I going to take advantage of? What doesn't make sense to me, et cetera. And I think that's true of all of the business people listening right now. You mm -hmm. have to do that as well. And again, one of the things that your group has to do is always talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Because you'll find that some guy in Cornwall has a fantastic idea with how to reach out to clients and all of a sudden it spreads and everybody's right. doing it. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. If, you, if you're part of a group, you can learn from others about what doesn't work as well. Yeah. David, as we wrap down here, uh, I would love to hear, actually just talking about this, what you read. What do you like to read? If you're going to get information, where do you go? And is there is there a couple of your top, you know, one or two books that you read over the years that just resonated for you for whatever reason? 
Yeah, I, I still read an incredible amount. Almost, I say a little bit too much. Online, I'm call, uh, following a lot of people on Twitter now in the FinTwit space down in the States. You know, Jim O'Shaughnessy, his son, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, who's fantastic. I don't know the handles off by heart, but he's yeah. amazing. But where I've turned to get a lot of my information now is podcasts. There are so many fantastic podcasts now where people have set them up. They're doing great interviews. I just mentioned Patrick O'Shaughnessy. He has got one called Invest Like the Best. And the depth of the interviews and the quality of the guests, second to none. Like, really, you'd learn way more listening to his 150 podcasts than you would going to a high-end university. Yeah. Podcasts have really made a difference. And, of course, you can multitask. You can listen to them while working out. You can listen to them while driving. So they provide that advantage. Books over the years, you know, I've read so many on business books. I read all the marketing books that come out because I've always been drawn to marketing. It's not something people think of before. I tend to be thought of around finance and publishing. But right. one of my passions is reading about marketing. I still read mm -hmm. all the stock market books. But if you said I had to pick one book to yeah. recommend, it'd probably be uh, Charlie Munger's Poor Charlie's Almanac. Oh, I've never read that. Uh, it's fantastic. I mean, he's just got so much wisdom in there. Some about investing, but a lot about life in general. And it's just one of the finest books I've ever crossed paths with. That's awesome. I've read a lot of Warren stuff, of course, over the years. But uh, and it's I think I maybe I was given Charlie's book along the way. I'm going to look soon as I hang up this yeah, call. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, I want to. Uh, I just want to wrap, uh, David, by uh, just you know just letting you know on behalf of uh, everyone on this call today and me personally, and you know I know Chris, you know just finds you one of the most, you know, interesting people on the universe. Uh, we want you to know how, how privileged and how appreciative we are of you making uh, this time for us today. I know it isn't something you do a lot of. We've talked about that before. Um, and I know you're an incredibly busy guy. You're involved in a whole bunch of different businesses right now. And, and uh, still, you're very, very active in what you do. Uh, but we are beyond grateful. Uh, just, just absolutely. I, I owe you, I owe you, I owe you huge and I'll, I'll do my best to, to repay, you know, your time and your wisdom and, and your wit. And I wanted to thank you. So thank you very much. But any, any last minute thing you want to say to yeah, our two very important things. One is that uh, my charge for doing this is you have to take me to A&W. Okay. I'm in. <laughs> but I'll tell you before your audience uh, buys into anything I've said too much, when this first went on your assistant, Tara, her, her name came across the screen, Tara English. And so I try to click on the English thinking, yeah, that's the language I want, yeah. not French. So this is the kind of mind you're working with here. Yeah. Right? Not that sharp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sharp. Anyway, I realized after, oh, no, that's her last name. Okay, I get it. So I'm not, I'm not that clever. No, thank you for having me. I really stopped doing this type of thing over the last five and ten years and gone a bit different direction. But I owed you one and happy to come on. It was a good interview. It went remarkably quickly. So thank you. And I want to just, uh, I want to just go, uh, guys, uh, as always, uh, please go online to any of my social media handles and uh, reach out. Tell us what you thought. Um, if you want to tag uh, David on what you thought, uh, his Twitter handle is at wealthy underscore barber, at uh, wealth underscore, sorry, okay. at wealth underscore, wealthy. right? At wealthy underscore barber. Okay. Say it again. At wealthy underscore barber. At wealthy underscore barber. So I've got that right. Sorry, David. My eyes aren't that great. Uh, yeah, Thank you, thank you again so much, David, for doing this for us today. To all of our listeners, to all the DLC mortgage agents in the group of companies, thank you very much. Uh, you are doing an amazing job during this time of crisis, and we are incredibly proud. Uh, be safe, stay well, and uh, David, I'll send you a fast message offline. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye now.